Hello and welcome to the Convex Community Call. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, a topic which is very close to my heart, which is game development. So we'll be looking at uh, the potentials that Convex opens up for uh, game developers and for game players and uh, all, the th all the things that might that might become possible very soon as we're about to uh, launch our protonet and, and suddenly that all of these things can, can sort of come alive. Um, so as usual in these calls, if, if um, you know, I'll be keeping an eye on chat if anyone wants to fire in any uh, any questions or ideas or topic for discussions, then you know just uh, please fire, fire them in and uh, you know we can we can sort of uh, you know take the topic where, where, wherever it goes. But you know just a, a sort of a personal note, I mean I've always enjoyed game development. It's always been a passion of mine. I've always liked writing little game engines and, and, and things for fun, you know not, not out of any aspiration for being, uh, you know, a, a game publisher or uh, anything like that, but um, because I do think it's one of the most interesting areas for programmers to um, develop game game software. Uh, it's got this little bit of everything. It's got user interface. It's got the sort of design of the game mechanics and all the sort of ideas and creativity that goes into that. It's got a lot of art, art, music, sound effects. Uh, all of these things go into making a great game. And ultimately, it's about crafting an experience that people find compelling. And yeah, I think there's some 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 good cases where Convex is uh, uh, potentially opens up some new opportunities in game development, uh, which I think is per, sort of particularly inter particularly interesting. Um, so just before um, before going into anything of you know too much detail on the sort of the uh, the sort of the content topics. I did want to just fire up a, a very quick uh, uh, a demo of something that uh, you know we built uh, uh, on Convex over the past couple of years, um, more as a sort of game prototype, but just to show you a little bit of what's possible. And what this is is kind of a voxel-based game. Uh, let me just um, switch the screen here. Um, okay, and I'm just going to start up uh, start up this little this little this little game that we have. And what you can see here is it's a. Uh, oops, I think I've I think I've teleported in underground. Uh, camps. Uh, let's try it again. One sec. Okay, misbehaving slightly. Oh, there we are. We're moving. Okay, we're moving now. So um, what this is is a voxel-based game. So very much inspired by Minecraft. Uh, you can tell by the sort of the blocky square based uh, scenery that's being generated. You know, as I fly around it generates new terrain so you can see the world being expanded as I explore and you know this is sort of characteristic of these kind of games where you've got procedural generation and really it's an infinite world it can extend as, as, as big as, as, you, as you want it just continues generating new, new terrain uh, as, as, as you fly around. Um, so this is very much like Minecraft. What is kind of interesting and unique about this, and uh, you know, some of you may have seen it before, but this is in fact running 100% uh, on-chain in Convex. So the entire game world is represented in Convex data structures and with, uh, with, with, with Convex, effectively Convex actors and smart contracts managing all of the rules of the game. So if I want to go and edit this this game, and I, or maybe say I want to build something and drop drop some uh, drop some blocks and build a little garden, all of these all of these blocks are effectively coming out of my inventory, which is effectively convex assets. This is like a fungible token. I've got a certain number of these green grass blocks, and as I drop them, you can see my my inventory down at the uh, bottom uh, the bottom left is is going down. I've now got 76 blocks, 75, 74, 73. So this is effectively tokens. This is a tokenized game asset that I have some quantity of in my inventory, and I can build. I can build all sorts of things. I can build a little statue if I want. There we are. Um, so it basically is this sandbox game. It's completely uh, free for the people to uh, to edit, create their own, build their own creations, build their own their own worlds, and all of the rules of the game, the game engine, are being 100% mediated. Through uh, convex smart contracts and through uh, all of these, all of these uh, uh, sort of on-chain on-chain assets. Now the game engine itself, of course, is running locally on my PC, so all the rendering is happening locally. But the information that actually makes up the game world is all is all stored on a on a convex convex instance. So. Um, you know, as you can see, it's it's running at a reasonable f performance. I'm getting uh, uh, you know hundreds of frames per second, uh, and all of this is running on basically on on convex technology. 
Um, so that alone is, I think, pretty impressive. Yeah, the fact we can have these instantaneous transactions, the fact we can make these, uh, you know, very fast edits to the world, uh, and we've got the rendering engine actually running directly off convex data structures shows that we you know we can really scale this up to a level where it's actually possible to do you know reasonably sophisticated things in terms of what's possible in uh, in, in, in modern game engines um, obviously just at the moment it's a relatively simple prototype but you this could obviously be developed in lots of different ways to create different kinds of assets interactions ways that different people can create a for example a player-based economy so all of this, all of this becomes possible with the uh, with with the sort of setup setup that we've got here. Um, for those who are interested in the sort of more technical details of of, of how this is operating, uh, I'll just you know bring up a little bit of code here. Um, so apologies if this is a little bit small, um, but you can actually see that there's some convex code in here, uh, and it. it it may be maybe a little bit incredible, but this this you know 80, 90 lines of, of code is actually the entire game world. That is the the the, the actor which stores all of the data uh, that represents the the entire this entire this entire universe. So you know convex code is typically very very compact. You don't need very much of it, and uh, this has all of the logic you need to create a basically a voxel-based world. So it's got you know some functions like uh, you know break block. If someone was to like uh, break a block at a particular location, um, what 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 happens? Well, it's 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 uh, checking whether the block can be bro broken. So it's failing if it's if it's empty. That could, that doesn't work. Um, but if it does work, then what it's doing is it's 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 adding the whatever you've whatever you've picked up to the inventory, and it's setting the block at that location. To, to nil, which is means empty in this in, in this context. Um, so they're relatively short, simple functions that basically describe the interaction that a, a player can have have with the world. And it's got some it's got some you know some tricks about translating coordinates so that it's a chunked world. So you don't have to generate an infinite amount of the world at once. You can just generate these chunks uh, that are like sixteen by sixteen by sixteen. Uh, at a time, and then translate these coordinates. So there's a little bit of logic like that, and there's a you know there's even stuff like you know code to fill a a you know a uh, a rectangular or a cuboid area with with blocks if you want to like you know rapidly fill large large areas. So all of this is represented in uh, represented in, in in convex code, and it's just this one data structure. In fact, uh, this this data structure called chunks actually stores all the world data. Uh, so the the chunk index is like the key in, in a map, and then the 4096 4, uh, uh, element vector is used to store the individual um, the individual voxels within a chunk. So that basically defines how the uh, how the, uh, how, the, how the world is data is stored. But this is also super compact, yeah. So if a chunk has never been never been created, then it's not using any space at all. And if a chunk, um, you know, contains a lot of, you know, simple blocks, well, it's only going to be one or two bytes per per block within the chunk. So uh, that uh, that that keeps the actual game storage uh, pretty pretty small, uh, which is of course what you want if you're playing a game that you've got like uh, you know something that you know lots of people are going to be viewing on a global state. Um, so so question so question. Is the game position persisted when you restart? Uh, yeah, so that's this is an option. Yeah, so you can either have it so that the world gets completely reset when you restart, and you know you get a completely new world. So if you just cleared this chunks map, you would get a completely blank new world, or you could indeed deploy a new actor like this and get a completely new blank new blank world. So that's how it sort of starts off in, initially. Uh, but you could also just say, okay, well, this is going to be a persistent world. So many games have the uh, concept of like a a, pers a persistent world where uh, different players can come and go at different times and interact with the game in in different ways, and go away again and come back and see what see what's changed. So you can absolutely run this as a persistent world game as well. So it really depends on the on the game what makes most sense for the uh, the dynamics you want in the game. So I would say that it's much harder to design good persistent world games um, because you know you have to think about things like well 
does it give too much of an advantage to the players who arrive first? Yeah, can they go around and steal all the good resources? Um, so if they can, then that makes it not so much fun for new players because they can't actually you know get started in the game very easily. So all of these kind of game design questions, I think, become very very important when you're when you're creating the world. But they say you know, that that's a that's a game design decision for the game developer. How do they actually want to uh, how to learn to operate that world? It's the same with things like inventories and items. Yeah. So if the world gets reset, do you get still get to keep your items? I mean, maybe. But again, you then have this question of then what happens in the game economy if someone's accumulated a lot of gold in one in one version of the world and then they they land in a fresh world with a massive piggy bank. You know, does that give them an unfair head start? In some games, it might. Uh, so it's a, it's a, but also that's an incentive perhaps for people to you know uh, uh, you know play a lot and, and and collect lots of gold so that when the world does reset, they can they can start with an advantage. So you've got to trade off a lot of these sort of uh, questions when you're sort of uh, uh, designing these games. Which I say, I mean, game development is fascinating. And one of the reasons it's so fascinating is because you have all of these options. You have infinite uh, possibility uh, about what's, what, what you can do. And then you just have to make these decisions and make all these design options. Um, but yeah, so but I'll highlight what I think is particularly interesting uh, for game developers on Convex. Firstly, it actually is really easy. Yeah, as you can see, it's only about 80, 90 lines of code represents the world. And I think the inventory, like the inventory system, which stores the uh, uh, how many blocks each player has is, you know, 60 lines of code or something like that. You can write really, really compact code um, that uh, that represents your world and spend the most of your time on, OK, the game design questions or the user interface or the graphics or the sound, all of these kind of things. The piece that you actually need to do on convex can be uh, can be pretty small. Uh, what other advantages convex give? Well, it's a very efficient uh, global uh, global store. So if you want uh, game assets to be persistent, if you want people to actually own their assets and own them on a decentralized basis, it's really the perfect platform for that. Yeah, so you can keep a you can keep a, a store and a database of who owns what. Uh, whether that's NFTs, whether that's some kind of in-game currency, uh, something that can be transacted uh, with other players. Uh, Convex is a perfect platform because that's really an economic system and Convex is ultimately an engine for economic systems. Uh, so all of those things are very, very simple and easy to build in Convex. And in fact, you can use all of the facilities we use for uh, tokenization, fungible tokens, for example, work perfectly for games. Yeah, that's exactly what you want in a sort of in-game currency as you as you, as you play the game. Um, it's also um, it's also great for like things like account identity. Yeah, who the users are. Um, you know, uh, decentralized identity is all built into Convex, so that's that's very valuable. And of course, security. Yeah, everything is cryptographically secured, so you know you've not got the problem with you know people hijacking accounts. And, and this kind of thing, um, you know, you have you have really strong cryptographic security behind everything that uh, the players the players do. Um, it's also flexible, so um, this this code might be good for version one of the game, but if you want to add some add some new features, yeah, so some maybe some new trading some new some new trading system or something like that, you know, the ability to swap certain certain items in your inventory for other items then it's easy to extend yeah you don't have to uh, you have, don't have to destroy the whole game world you can actually uh, you can actually have a governance mechanism that enable you to uh, drop in here and sort of edit the world and, and add new features and do that dynamically so um, it's, it's very sort of powerful and flexible in that uh, another question it is real time how many TPS uh, could run alongside a payment app yes it could so it absolutely could run, run out alongside a payment app. Um, what I would say is when the player does an action that changes the game world or the state of the game or the assets on chain, then you will need a convex transaction. But if I just, I mean, if I just fly around the world, let me just run it again. Um, if I just fly around the world, I'm not actually changing the world. I'm just observing it. I'm just a viewer. So that's zero transactions per second. Yeah, there's, there's no transactions going through the uh, going through convex in order to just observe the world. Um, and you know, 90% of the time, players may not actually be 
changing the world. So Convex is very well suited for games where players are going to make, you know, explore the world and then take some actions. And those actions will count as transactions, but, you know, most of the time they're not going to be actually executing any transactions. Uh, frames per second, I mean, it's currently running at, what's that, 60 frames per second? It's, for some reason I'm getting more frames per second when I move, which is kind of interesting. Um, that's probably something to do with the, the, the way that the frame rate's being calculated. Um, but yeah, it's running a lot of frames per second. Yeah, um, uh, but that's that's mostly at the client side. That's just using data that it's pulled it's pulled off off convex. So that doesn't really put any load on the convex network. Whatever the client does is sort of independent of the uh, uh, of the uh, um, of the network. So you're not putting any pressure or stress on the uh, on the on the on, on the network when that happens if i was to do an app an action that like changes the game world so if i want to you know drop some blocks down then these actions are turning into convex transactions so those those do count towards a sort of a, a sort of a tps load on the network um, so i think one of the one of the things i would say of you know and the downside of running a decentralized world um, like this is that you do need to design your game so you don't have too many transactions yeah you don't want each player producing hundreds of transactions every second because you know that then creates you know probably probably too much load on the network and probably it's uh, you know going to get uh, you know expensive for the players if they if they're you know having to pay a lot of transaction fees as they as they as they play the game so you want to probably design your game in a way that only certain things go on to the on-chain on chain world and other things other things just get uh, get either calculated locally at the client or you've maybe got some back end server that's sort of supporting your game um, you know these kind of things like in game messaging yeah i wouldn't suggest putting in game messaging or directly on convex through convex transactions you could do it but you know it's it's probably not the best use of of, uh, of transaction fees to, to do that so you're better using some kind of peer-to-peer -peer game messaging system or something like that um, but yeah absolutely you can run along a payment app and you know the, the, the nice thing about having the uh, you know the the on-chain state is you could do um, you could do uh, you know payments transactions micro transactions uh, directly on convex and directly get the uh, in-game assets delivered to your account so the entire thing could be settled in a single atomic transaction so it removes a whole lot of pain if you're doing micro transactions or, or, or sort of in-game uh, payments uh, depending on your game's business model yeah so there's some games which are much more based around um, uh, in-game purchases whereas other games of course you buy the game and then it's all it's all free forever and you can do what you like with it and, and that's up again up completely up to the game designer what they want to do convex is just a tool that lets you do certain parts of that uh, efficiently and uh, and you know and, and conveniently um, okay so I mean so what kind of games um, suit convex I would say it's games where there's some kind of some kind of economic structure in the game that you want to realize yeah so either that's in-game currencies or maybe it's micro payments maybe it's transactions maybe it's some kind of resources that you can collect or manage in a persistent world anything that has these kind of features uh, is probably quite well suited uh, for convex the kind of games that probably don't make much sense on convex are things like arcade games yeah there's really no economic system that your typical arcade game is interacting with maybe there's some achievements or something like that but you know most of the game is 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 either single player or you're playing with a few friends locally or on a local server and it doesn't make any sense to have a sort of central you know central ledger or central store backing the game so uh, also things like uh, uh, first person shooters yeah where there's a lot going on and you know it's all about um, low latency and you know it's all optimized for you know fast movement and combat um, that's probably again less less sensible to try and put all of the data from that uh, through, through convex it probably adds too much latency for you know games where response time is like a key aspect of the game so convex is super low latency but you're never going to get low latency 
as fast as if you were doing you know UDP to a local server or something like that, which is what you know FPS uh, players would expect. So those kind those kind of you know twi uh, you know reflex games are unlikely to be you know particularly good cases. But things about city building, uh, games where you've got like, some kind of sandbox, some kind of creative environment, games where there's collectibles, card games. Um, uh, what is civilization kind games, uh, sort of kingdom management games? These kind of games are, um, uh, are I think, pretty good, pretty good ca candidates. And you know, you can do you can do a lot with complex capabilities to sort of support those kind of games, especially if you want to create this sense of like a a, a, a in-game economy or a sort of persistent world that players can interact with over time. Uh, I think that's really where the sort of the sort of the sweet spot uh, for for a lot of convex um, development is is going to be. Um, so, but yeah, good questions. I mean, um, I, I I do think there are obviously a lot of trade offs and just design decisions that have to be made when you're building a game. And you know, some games are going to be a good fit fit for convex. Uh, some might want to use convex in a limited capacity, let's say for the in-game currency or something like that. Um, other games, it doesn't, probably doesn't make much sense at all. So I'll be the first to say that you know you've got to you know pick your um, pick your design and your use case whether it whether whether it makes sense or not. Um, what I, I would say though is we have proved that it is possible to build fairly sophisticated uh, um, or fairly intensive games uh, on convex, have them running in real time, and have them uh, you know um, uh, be a compelling experience for people who. Who, who who want to interact with them? So uh, you know the potential is there for the people who can who can who, you know who can who can who can design a game that really makes the best use of these uh, these capabilities. Um, let me uh, let me let me uh, shut shut that down. Um, so um, so yeah, so I, I talked a little bit about the sort of the 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 game code, how you can write these sort of very uh, uh, very you know sort of efficient little. Uh, um, uh, modules to actually represent persistent worlds. Um, I would say that you can use a lot of convex standard libraries are actually perfectly good for uh, game development. So this convex.asset that's a that's a standard uh, convex convex library that helps you to manage different kinds of assets. That that w should work perfectly in any any game. Um, the NFT solutions should work perfectly in any game. Uh, if you want your currencies, if your assets to be, let's say, uh, tradable um, and like have a market for the assets, then you could certainly put in get your in-game currencies or your in-game tokens uh, on Taurus and have that as a sort of tradable asset on the automated market maker. So you could have a little uh, exchange listing for your in-game in assets uh, using using Taurus, which is which is our Dex. Um, and a lot of the other tools that we have, like uh, decentralized identity, the uh, uh, the DID based system, is is perfectly good for games. Um, so all of these things, I think, you know, um, you know, help to uh, you know make it uh, practical to build the sort of on chain infrastructure that that you might want. So. Um, So yeah, anything else? Anything else I should just say about say say about this? Um, well, one thing that is quite interesting, and this is this is um, you know again probably a bit more for the techies, but um, when we do the um, uh, rendering in this game, let me just find it. Um, yeah, uh, when we do the rendering in this game, so when we're creating a um, When we're creating the data, which is going to be shown on screen, um, what we are doing is we're actually using the in-memory convex data structures. So these are the same data structures that uh, the peers use to store the data. Uh, so the, the 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 actual the in-memory data structures in in RAM are the same. Are the same uh, structures that uh, we use in the renderer. Yeah, they are really efficient, and they're fast enough that we can use the um, uh, we can use the uh, uh, 
yeah here so here here for example what we're doing is we're um, doing this loop over all of the blocks within a chunk and we are um, taking the chunk data so chunk data is the uh, is the basic um, uh, the vector this is the internal co uh, convex data structure which is storing the uh, storing the the world if you like um, we're accessing that data structure so we use we're getting each individual block from that data structure and as we as we do that we are going to this add block function we are actually then writing the model geometry that is going to go to the graphics card which is going to render that particular chunk so each, it's literally iterating all over the blocks in a convex data structure and using that to build the model geometry which gets then shipped to the graphics card for display so this is really really um, uh, performance sensitive code and it's totally fine using convex data structures for you know highly performance sensitive code like this so um, it's one of the reasons convex is fast is because the data structures are good and they're and, and they're very efficient so all of this all of this is actually literally building the triangles that are making up the uh, the meshes that you see on on, on the screen so uh, it's it's it, it's quite a good example i think of of using the low level convex data structures within another application yeah and obviously this is written in you know this is this is written on this jvm code so you're running within the jvm so you can access these things directly so you couldn't it maybe would be harder to do that if you were using a completely different uh, runtime environment uh, but it's certainly possible any jvm based system you can you can do this this kind of stuff uh, directly which is uh, quite powerful um, so question what's the link for running the game uh, it is on github um, so um, it, we don't we don't have a published version of this yet so you can you can clone it on github and, 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 run, and run this locally um, uh, we may probably have a look at creating some kind of package version or something once um, once protonet is live so that we can actually have like it'd be quite nice maybe to get a little game world running that's like you know sort of persistent from from um, that you know we can have as like a sort of historic historic world that uh, people can spawn into and have a look around and, and explore it and maybe add, add some of their own things um, so um, that's certainly an interesting little project that'd be quite fun to do once uh, once once protonet is live as I say at the moment it's just it's just code so that you know developers can play with and, ex and, and, ex and explore it as a bit of a sandbox um, if there's demand if lots of people want to I can I can create a package version of it I guess uh, so if uh, yeah, so ping me on the Discord if if lots of people are interested in that, I'm happy to uh, uh, create uh, some kind of like a uh, runnable runnable build or something like that. Maybe we can put it up on Steam. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Steam is like a, a game distribution system that a lot of a lot of game developers use to um, uh, distribute their games and and sell their games. So it, you know it's basically a, a, a shop marketplace for games. Um, so. Uh, and I think it would be fairly easy to uh, to publish something like this on on Steam. So that's 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 certainly a certainly a possibility. Um, of course, the question is, do you know? Do you, do you then get the question of like, okay, do, does the person who downloads the game do they have a Convex account or not? Yeah, and 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 if if not, they need to get one in order to be able to ac ac to run the game on the main Convex network. Um, which obviously the game developer can do; they can create accounts for their players and stuff like that. Um, but you know, just an extra extra thing because the player is going to need to have a private key. They're going to need to have the key pair and all of this sort of set set up, which the game can obviously do for the players, but uh, um, to make it so they don't know it's happening. But you know, there's just a little bit of complexity and operational complexity in in getting the uh, the key security right uh, if you're going to publish it so that people actually have account access on. On ProtoNet or a sort of a live, a live version of the network. So currently we're just running this on this sort of the test the test network version of the network. But yeah, I'll, I'll drop the the link in uh, in, uh, in 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 the, in the video uh, after after this call if uh, people want to have a look at the the repo or or, or, or explore explore the, the code a little bit a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, let's switch back switch back to this one. So, um, so other things that I think are quite interesting in f from game design. Um, one one thing that often comes up in games is okay. Well, what information do players have? And this is 
quite an interesting topic because in some games um, it's, tot it's a game of perfect knowledge like in chess you know the state of the board you can see the whole board you can see all the pieces you can see all you know all the rules everything's well defined there's no secrets in the game of chess uh, but other games like card games it's really important that the other player can't see your hand otherwise you get a you know a sort of really really big advantage and this creates some interesting challenges for game design if you're running them on a uh, public network where the transactions from all parties are at least potentially visible if someone wants to do the work to you know find out what the transactions are and when they happen and, 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 and who did them and stuff like that so there's a potential for cheating if if it's possible to exploit the information which uh, appears uh, on, on, on chain um, now game app obviously can keep information private and not and not publish it on chain but you know there's a bunch of uh, there's a, also challenges with that because you know if it, people are running their local game copy the local game client then client side hacks and you know changing the data in the client is obviously very easy to do so you know a card game wouldn't be a poker game for example wouldn't be a very good poker game if 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 if, if the players could just change their hands to aces whenever they whenever they felt like it um, so question is well how do you solve that in a in a in a sort of decentralized game and there's some interesting challenges here uh, but interestingly there's some quite cool solutions so um, one way you can do it for example is you can uh, pre-commit to a shuffle yeah so if you've got like a deck of cards in your hand you can say okay I'm going to randomly create a shuffle and I'm going to pre-commit to that uh, that shuffle and I'm going to hash the ordering of the cards that I've that I've shuffled I, I post that ordering and say here's the hash of my shuffle and then the other player also does a shuffle uh, and gives you okay now shuffle them like this um, and uh, so you both get to do a shuffle uh, and then you can both check whether the other player cheated by whether whether they conformed to the shuffle after the game so at the end of the game you can reveal everyone's shuffle and you can prove that in fact the 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 order in which people received their cards and played their cards was actually actually valid based on the shuffle order that they uh, that they declared so um, that kind of trick is is the kind of thing that you might do if you're tr trying to build a, a sort of a fully decentralized uh, game and uh, there's some interesting you know interesting questions about when you reveal certain information and and how that how that affects affects the gameplay and, and stuff like that but it's it, it's certainly possible and it's, it's definitely the kind of thing that would happen in card games or things like that where you've got some secret information uh, but you don't want that uh, you don't want players to be able to cheat with that information so by making a pre-commit to uh, to a shuffle for example uh, you can then go and validate that shuffle at the end and you know penalize a player if they if they cheated on their on their, on their shuffle so there's an example of the kind of uh, additional game design options and, and and features that you know are worth considering if you're going to put uh, information on chain that might help people to cheat uh, you have to sort of counter it with some of these kind of messages. Of course, nothing in any of this stops people from using a traditional game server. So the way a lot of games handle securities is you have a server run either by you know the game company themselves or by enthusiasts or by people in the community, and they run a particular a particular server, and then other people connect to that server. And then that server is, is the sort of authoritative um, source for what happens in the game, and it can hold secret information that the players don't don't get to see in order to, that it's that it's fair, and that still works with Convex. Yeah, so you could quite easily have a model where you've got the game client, uh, which is doing all of the uh, the graphics and user interface aspects of the game. You've got a game server, which is doing all of the secret. Uh, uh, things and it's validating the server logic and it's keeping a consistent view of the you know what's going on in the game in real time uh, as a game server and all the players connect to that game server if they want to you know want to play together and then convex on the side can be keeping track of transactions of assets of in-game resources uh, the economic aspects um, that are 
perhaps shared across multiple different game servers. Yeah, so the identity of the player, you know, what kind of accomplishments, achievements they've got, all of that might make sense to share, you know, more broadly, uh, so that all many different game servers can can access and use that use the, use that information. Um, so that's the kind of way that you know I'd, I'd 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 guess a more sophisticated multiplayer game might want to be want to be set up. Uh, so you use convex for the stuff where convex is good for. You run a traditional game server for your you know more normal uh, multiplayer game backend. And then you have the game clients um, doing all of the the usual uh, user interface sort of aspects. Um, so um, that's that's I, I guess is a sort of a, a sort of quick overview of you know some of the design sort of some sort of design features and and, and, and things that might make sense. Other things that I I think are potentially interesting are things like um, having. Uh, uh, having game assets um, and the ability to download game assets and you probably don't want to put large content or media on chain because uh, it's not really designed for you know content storage and distribution but you can put the hashes of the content on chain and and use that to validate you know have I got have I got the correct downloadable content have I got the correct media have I got the correct game files all of this kind of thing so it's a good it's a good way to establish sort of roots of trust. Put uh, put uh, uh, cryptographic hashes on on uh, ensure the authenticity of game assets. These kind of things, and then you could have the download of the assets from uh, you know uh, either more traditional content based services or indeed a sort of upcoming data lattice capabilities where it's more for content distribution and and, and validation. Um, which is, you know, something we're seeing quite a lot of uh, sort of demand for at the moment. You know, how to do to share larger or private data files between people who are authorized or people who purchase them and things like that. So there's a bit of interchange there between the whole uh, on-chain uh, convex data and the sort of data lattice sort of systems. Um, so um, have I heard of in-game assets getting hacked? Uh, is a Great question. So, in-game things get hacked all the time. I mean, this is this is just happens everywhere in the game industry. There's there's tons of people hacking games. Um, you get cheaters. You get things like bots. So people uh, uh, people like first-person shooters. This is a big problem in in in, in the you know the sort of uh, military first-person shooter games. You get things called aim bots. Which are bits of software that give you perfect aim, so that you you just hit every shot instantly, yeah. Which is of course a massive unfair advantage if uh, if you're playing a, uh, playing a, a shoot a first person shooter game, yeah. And it's obviously very unfair on the other players, and it's very hard for people actually to stop these bots because they're running on the client side. Uh, so anything on the client side, basically, you can't trust to behave properly. Um, and yeah, it's a huge, and that's that's just one aspect. I mean, obviously, people. But there's piracy, so people uh, copying content and, and possibly modifying it. There's people using uh, games to distribute malware. So if you've got a hacked copy of a game, it's very easy for people to insert a virus and say, hey, you know, download this free hacked copy of a game, but in fact there's a virus inside it. So that's exactly the kind of situation where you want to have you know, uh, cryptographic hashes and you check the integrity of the file uh, to ensure that it's a, you know, a legitimate thing before you download it and run it. Um, so that's definitely that's definitely a risk. Um, uh, do people try and hack e economic systems? Yeah, absolutely as well. So if you've got a game where there's any kind of in-game currency, uh, you know, people will try and figure out a, a clever way to give themselves infinite money. And if you don't really design your game security well, then that can completely destroy an in-game economy. Yeah, and the entire game world can be messed up if some people have infinite money. Um, and you know, completely blows your game design out the window. So that kind of hack is 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 a very real risk. And particularly if the game assets have real world monetary value, and there's actually a financial incentive to, you know, hack the in-game assets in order that you can sell them. For example, uh, this kind of thing is a is a, is a is a big challenge. So um, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, Call of Duty, you could pay a hacker and they'd max your account. Exactly. I mean, they, they might not even be a hacker. They might be, they might just be someone who, who, who's, who's outsourcing it to a third world country where they'll play the game for, you know, 70 hours or something and, 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 and get your account to the max level so you can skip the boring bits. Um, but yeah, there are also people who hack other people's accounts and steal accounts. And some of these accounts can be worth, you know, thousands of, thousands of pounds, thousands of dollars. Um, so you know there is a there is a business in hacking people's accounts of like these high level pla characters with lots of high level equipment that's actually worth real world money and you know people would would hack those um, and you know a lot of games don't take security particularly seriously uh, until they've until they've actually experienced these problems and then they realise how important it is so I'd absolutely say you've got to really build security into the game pretty much from day one if you're planning to have any multiplayer economy yeah uh, it, it's absolutely critical otherwise you know the hacks just become lucrative and they become uh, uh, they become you know uh, you know an obvious target for hackers to uh, to uh, experiment with so um, yeah so all of this kind of stuff is is sort of kind of uh, kind of kind of critical if you're going to uh, if you're going to design a good a game with a with a real economy um, so um, why would it be worth switching in the first place? Um, I assume you mean not like switching to convex. I mean, I think you've got to kind of design your, figure out whether your game needs convex. Uh, um, so, to my earlier comments, does, does the game suit using convex? Uh, if you've already built something and you already, already, or it already works, then you know I don't think you're likely to rewrite the game. Yeah, I mean, most likely it's a new game. Is going to come out that you'd want to, you know, take advantage of convex capabilities. Um, so um, I think for the game studio to switch, I mean, one of the things that um, one of the things that uh, you know we have in the community done a bit of is is testing out convex integration with game engines. So um, you know, a, a couple of folks have uh, integrated convex with uh, Unity, Unity, for example. So created a Unity game where Unity was uh, talking to Convex and sending transactions to the network. Um, uh, I've personally been trying out the Godot game engine, which is a, a very nice open source game engine. And uh, uh, I think that should be relatively easy to integrate to Convex. The only thing that they haven't got is they haven't got the uh, cryptographic signature feature in Godot uh, out of the box. So need to figure out how to uh, get Godot to sign transactions, and as soon as we've done that, I think in Godot integration is pretty is pretty easy. Uh, I've not tried Unreal Engine, um, but those are probably the three big engines. So you've got Unreal, you've got Godot, you've got um, uh, Unity, um, and if we can get all of those three engines having good convex integration, then for the game developer it's really really easy. All they do is they do, they, they put in a convex plugin. And you know they use their favourite tools, their favourite um, editors, their environment, their programming languages that they're already used to, and they just use this Godot plugin if they want to do a transaction on the network. And then they, obviously they can des design their their game assets or their, their in-game currencies or something to use that. Um, but that's a relatively simple. It's a relatively simple integration once you've built the plugin, yeah, and once you've uh, got the plugin uh, working in a way that fits that particular engine. So there's a bit of work to make to make that uh, operational, but it's it's not a it's not a particularly um, huge project. Definitely a fun project, by the way. If anyone's interested in game development and wants to do some game engine integration stuff with Con Convex, then I'm super happy to collaborate with people who want to uh, want to build some of these sort of tools because uh, you know I think they're quite uh, those are quite essential if you're going to tap into the uh, the uh, the communities that use these particular game engines. They're really going to want a plugin that. Um, that makes it simple, so they don't have to, you know, go and figure all out all the crypto stuff themselves. Because uh, the plug, what's the plugin got to do? It's got to know how to talk to Convex. It's got to know how to talk to Convex peer, and it's got to know how to create transactions, and it's got to know how to sign transactions and sort of submit them to the network. And it probably also needs to know how to query information from the network. Yes, yeah, so if you want to, you know, ask ask what the player's current balance of gold is, then it's got to be able to ask that that, that, that right question to the network. So those are the kind of things that the plugin would have to support, um, and then everything else—the graphics engine, uh, the the all of this kind of stuff—is just you know you can, the engine is just doing its normal thing. So 
um, you know, it's just for those economic parts that uh, you, you potentially need the, the convex plugin for. Um, if you decide you want to run a something that's more JVM based and you want to do the more sophisticated stuff like I did in that sort of uh, the block game demo, um, then uh, that's a slightly a slightly more involved process. Um, uh, uh, there are JVM game engines as well, of course, um, but uh, you know you want that 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 is uh, a bit more a little bit more custom work because you'd be want to tap into the uh, underlying convex code, which is um, you know it's uh, I wouldn't say it's hard, but it's it, it's uh, it's a sort of a, a little bit harder than just using a plugin in a, in, in a game engine. So that's a bit of a more sophisticated. Uh, thing probably makes more sense for people who want to do a custom game engine um, and they want very specific features and they decide okay I'm gonna make it so that I can talk directly to convex um, what's the difference between an API and a plugin great question so um, an API is an interface and I think when people say API they sometimes mean uh, a, an API of like a library, so a library has these 10 different functions. Uh, they also quite commonly mean a remote API, like a REST API, where you send requests to a, a remote interface. So there's a bunch of HTTP, HTTPS hopefully, requests that you send that uh, interact with some web service or some you know, back-end server. Uh, both of those get described as, AP, as APIs. Um, API tends to be lower level, yeah. So it's like the programmatic interface. What are the functions you can call? What information do you send? Need to send to those functions, uh, and what information comes back, and maybe what error messages come back if you do something wrong. So the API is more like the specification of the uh, the, the interface that uh, that that you uh, that you talk to. And now, what a plugin does is a plugin um, in these game engines, like gives you extra tools that hopefully do all of the API stuff for you. Um, I'm wondering if I can demo this. Uh, let me let me see one second. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to demo it directly. One sec. Uh, I'm just going to see if I can fire up the Godot engine. Godot. Okay. Let's see if this works. Um, right. Not tried this before, but. This is this is Godot. This is the um, this is the uh, game the game engine uh, that uh, is open source. It's a really powerful game engine. You can see this nice uh, sort of three D three D environment. You, know, you can edit the world. I've got some uh, I've got some planet here that I can move around. Um, this is a kind of tool that game developers are sort of super familiar to work with. They use this to design levels, to design different kinds of game worlds. If I run the game. What do I get? Is this going to work? Uh, um, it's just not displaying in the right point of the place in the screen. But yeah, this is this is a sort of working little game de demo I built. Uh, so what would happen in if we had a convex plugin? You see, you've got these different um, nodes in this sort of scene graph. So you've got a, a, a camera, you've got a world environment. I've got this. Rigid body, which is the uh, which is the the uh, this uh, this uh, planet in this in this in this space. I think I have some kind of um, yeah. This this sky box with the stars is uh, is is one of these things as well. So what what would happen with a convex plugin is it would probably add a new node type here. So it would say convex or something like that. Um, yeah, it does look like Blender. Yeah, it is. It is a bit like Blender. Um, obviously, Blender is more a tool for creating the assets. Once you've created the assets, it's very easy to import into the game engine to then create a game that you can uh, that you can run and operate. Um, so the so so um, 
uh, you can you would have a little convex uh, node, for example, in your graph, and that node you you could configure to uh, uh, then do whatever you wanted it to do, whether that's transfer assets, whether it's to uh, 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 respond to certain events. So the kind of thing that would happen is okay when when I when I when I pick up a certain item, I'm going to send a message to the uh, to the convex plugin. And the convex plugin is then going to do the transaction to uh, to say that I now own this item on the on the ledger, yeah, on the or the, or the, the database which has been stored on chain. So that's kind of what the convex plugin would do. But you want it to be integrated, yeah. You want it to appear as one of these as one of these nodes in in, in the in the graph here for a Godot developer. They'd expect to see the. The basically all the all the entities that they're interacting with here, so they can explore them, and any sort of properties, any details about the uh, uh, about the uh, plugin or about the, the the link to the network, you know, what's the user's account, stuff like that. Um, all of that information you'd expect to be able to see in this editor here. So the game engine integration is quite um, uh, is quite important if you want to make it easy for a game developer to. To, to understand and use um, the uh, convex from within the environment they're familiar familiar with. Now they can of course write code. Yeah, they can they can go into the script editor and they can go and write a bunch of code and they could go and they could go and talk to uh, sort of convex APIs directly if they wanted to. But that will be you know it'd be an extra an extra hurdle for people to figure out how to do that. Whereas if you give them a plugin, they they don't have to they don't have to worry about that stuff nearly as much. So at least that's that's the way I think about it. Yeah, if you want to make it really convenient for developers, then there's some kind of some kind of plugin is is the way to go. And uh, what's the thing? They have a they have a they actually have all of these plugins. Yeah, uh, available to download. So if I particularly want one of these things, I've got for example a uh, Godot Easy Vehicle Physics plugin. Yeah, so I can go and I can go and download that and import that into my project. And basically, the idea would be to have some a convex plugin appear in this kind of uh, marketplace or in this sort of library, so that people can just download them and and use them directly. It's like a little search engine for Godot for Godot plugins here. So that's the kind of that's the kind of interface that I think you want to have in order to uh, uh, in order to make it you know really friendly for developers to to do this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, okay, but yeah, that's just you know, just to give people you know less familiar with these kind of things, a bit of an example of what um, of what uh, what these game engines um, you know look like nowadays, um, and you know they're coming, they're they're really really powerful. Yeah, you can do stuff in these that you know would have taken taken months in uh, in uh, in many old um, in old game development contexts. You can now do in you know a few hours with a, with a modern game engine. So it really is very powerful. This is what make, is making it possible for so many more developers to actually build games. Is because the engines are just getting really, really good and really powerful and and, and and very flexible in what they can do. So we know we obviously just want to tap into that. There's no point reinventing reinventing the concept of the, the game engine because uh, Convex should just be a component in the game. It should never will never be the whole game. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Enough. 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 God over now. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that's interesting. Just to sort of give you sort of uh, some ideas about how how we would we would potentially integrate with some of these some of these sort of tools. And you know, I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to create a you know some uh, uh, a, a, like a um, an example project. So look, here is a here is a Godot project, open source that anyone can download that demonstrates uh, integration with Convex. Uh, so you can have some have some transactions. You can um, have some assets, um, have an in-game currency or something like that, and that's kind of, that kind of works out of the box. And you know, people can say, okay, okay, now I understand from the Godot way of doing things. How do I build a game? And we can do exactly the same thing for you know Unity and uh, um, Unity and uh, Unreal Engine and you know any of the other engines. But I think Godot is a particularly good choice because a it's quite user friendly. Uh, and B, it's open source, so it's something that's sort of I think uh, in terms of ethos is something that you know we'd like to work with game engines and, and uh, that are open source tools because uh, that's a good fit for what we uh, what we do with Convex. So um, yeah, I mean, any other thoughts or questions? Any people uh, tried out any game development using the decentralized platforms at all?
No. I think it's hard. I mean, I think it's very early days for decentralized games. I mean, there are there are a few of them, but I would say that no no decentralized game yet has really hit any kind of mainstream usage. Um, so, uh, and because it's 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 a it's it's complex it's complexity that a lot of game developers aren't you know familiar with, um, and you know they they are used to using doing things the more traditional way, and you know it's fairly avant garde to try and build a blockchain game or a decentralized game uh, uh, second it adds a whole bunch of hurdles yeah so if you have to have like uh, you know uh, on-chain assets tokens uh, security keys all of this it's a barrier to entry to building a game which you know most of the game developers say well that sounds complicated and also um, I think probably there's not really been any system uh, that is offered like low latency and the sort of power that Convex has so it's actually probably very hard to do what you want to do still with a lot of uh, decentralized platforms um, so uh, I think it's it's early days before someone actually creates a really hit, big hit game that, that uses decentralized components um, uh, I mean, there's been a couple of these crypto NFT type games and collectible games that you know have got a little bit of a uh, little bit of traction, but you know I think they are more like flash in the pan and they are more speculative than they were like um, you know really long lived games that have sort of attracted a you know uh, you know sort of thriving long term community. So I think there's it's still a very wide open space for people to innovate and do some, do some, do some cool things. Okay, well, coming to the end of our hour, hopefully that's sort of been an interesting little tour of some of the uh, some of the things uh, in, in 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 game development and and, and, and convex and uh, where some of the future opportunities might be. As I say uh, it's a, a topic I love. Anyone who wants to drop by on Discord and chat game development anytime, uh, love to have some conversations. And if anyone wants to actually build some games, then again, I'm you know super happy to collaborate on those kind of those kind of projects and you know help people figure out you know how to use convex best because you know it is it is a tool ultimately and you know a game is about creating a great experience for players and if we can help people do that all the better all right well take care everyone and uh, uh, see you all next week have a good one bye for now